Professor Michael Walzer is a leading American political philosopher and a noted public intellectual. He's a professor emeritus of social science at the Institute for Advanced Studies in uh, Princeton. His work has grappled with a wide range of topics and themes in political theory and moral philosophy, including political obligation, the ethics of war, nationalism and ethnicity, equality, economic justice, and the welfare state. His many books, according to one account, he has written 27 books, but who's counting, include the often cited Just and Unjust Wars, Spheres of Justice, The Company of Critics, Thick and Thin, Moral Argument at Home and Abroad, and On Toleration. He's been credited for the major contribution to the revival of practical issue-based or issue-focused ethics to the development of a pluralist approach to political and moral life. His most recent work is Thinking Politically, Essays in Political Theory that came out in 2009. He's also the editor of Law, Politics, and Morality in Judaism and of the Jewish Political Tradition, a collaborative project focused on the history of Jewish political thought. Professor Walzer, Walzer has a rich career outside academia as an editor and author. He's a contributed editor for the New Republic and co-editor of the Quarterly Dissent. His articles and interviews frequently appear in the New York Times and similarly distinguished newspapers and journals. He's currently working on the toleration and accommodation of difference in all of its forms and also on, on the third volume of the Jewish political tradition. Among many other awards, in April 2008, Professor Walzer received the prestigious Spinoza Lens, a biannual prize for ethics in the Netherlands. And in the coming January, he's traveling to the University of uh, Chicago to deliver the Dewey Lecture in Law and Philosophy on the timely topic of putting political leaders on trial. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Walzer. So it's, it's always nice to be in on a beginning be present at the creation. It's, uh, um, and I'm, I'm um, although the subject is cultural pluralism, this is the new school, so I can be a little off topic. I will talk about political pluralism, which is, I think, the necessary um, uh, framework within which cultural pluralism is possible. And I'm going to focus on, on one issue that is central to the question of political pluralism, mm -hmm. And that is the experience of ruling over others, over strangers, resident aliens, <coughs> new immigrants, national and religious minorities, and conquered peoples. This isn't only an issue in imperial states like the old Soviet Union or the British Empire, but in all states. The United States rules over Indian tribes. The Norwegians rule over the Laps and now over Macedonians and Turks. The Italians rule over immigrant Albanians, the French over immigrant Algerians, the Egyptians over Copts, the Turks over Kurds, the Chinese over Muslim tribesmen, and, and so on. In the long centuries of the exile in all of the diaspora, the Jews ruled only over themselves. We ruled only over ourselves when we ruled at all. The autonomous or semi-autonomous communities that uh, Yeri talked about, the Kihilot of Ashkenaz and of Spain and North Africa, and the Ottoman Empire and Poland, Hungary and Russia, were all of them radically homogeneous. They consisted only of Jews. Good Jews and bad Jews, no doubt, but as Rashi said, bad Jews are still Jews. They do not become other. Even the harem, ostracism or excommunication, did not produce otherness in the kahal, since its point was to force compliance with communal norms to bring people back, not, at least until the case of Spinoza, to exclude them permanently. So the Jews were responsible only for the well-being of the Jews, while our Gentile rulers were responsible for all the people they ruled, including the Jews. They were never reliably responsible. 
We all know the history. But we often turn to them for protection against populist preachers and murderous mobs in the Middle Ages, for example. And sometimes, at least, we were protected. If we had never been protected, we wouldn't be here uh, today. In many of the exilic communities, we counted on the Gentile rulers to protect us even from our own criminals. They took charge of corporal and capital punishment. And we were not unhappy to surrender that ugly work. Jewish writers sometimes claimed that we were too good to exercise political power, even for our own protection. You can find the 20th century philosophical version of this idea in Franz Rosenzweig and the religious version in Abraham Isaac Cook. We weren't brutal enough, so we looked for protection to the people who were brutal enough. <clears throat> but I should remind you of Yuda Halevi's comment on this question in his philosophical treatise, The Kuzari, the rabbi asks the Khazar king, tells the Khazar king, that the Jews have a closer relation to God than do the nations that, quote, flog and slay, whose power and might are great, whose walls are strong, and whose chariots are terrible. We have a closer relation to God than those people. The king replies, that might be so if your humility were voluntary but it is involuntary. And if you had power, you too would flog and slay. And the rabbi responds, you have touched our weak spot. <laughs> but what is most important for my argument today is that no one, no group of others look to us, to our power and might for protection. Though we are enjoined in the Talmud to visit the Gentile sick and help the Gentile poor, that is for the sake of peace, not because we were in any political sense responsible for their sick or poor, nor did they ever count on our help or argue that they were entitled to it. Think of all that as part of what it means to be stateless. We were never without communal institutions, but these were radically our own. They gave us some power, always very limited, to collect taxes among ourselves and to organize welfare services, but only for ourselves. States have a wider reach. This is obvious in the case of autocratic regimes where the autocrat is responsible for all his subjects and not just for his relatives, even though most autocratic rulers privilege their relatives. But even in democratic regimes, where the citizens are collectively responsible for themselves, they are not responsible only for themselves. They have obligations with regard to everyone who lives within the borders of the state. In the United States, the Supreme Court has made itself the protector of powerless minorities among American citizens, and also, very importantly, of aliens insisting that foreign residents in this country have rights and monitoring how officials of the executive branch deal with them. Today, the issues that the court addresses arise everywhere. All states are radically pluralist, and all governments are responsible for some set of others. As I've suggested, Jews counted on responsible rulers though we were more often in the position of begging for protection than of claiming it as our right. Thus, the ancient prayer for the king, adapted in some Orthodox congregations in the United States into a prayer for the president, which expresses the hope that he, the president, will deal kindly with us. It's an odd thing to be asking of a president who has to ask us for our votes, but it is evidence of the exilic state of mind. And I want to stress again that in the years of the exile, no one ever asked us to deal kindly with them. 
being responsible for the common good of a pluralist society, for the well-being of strangers, for all the others, that takes getting used to. It's a feature of political life, political life, not of personal or familial or communal life. We may contribute privately or personally to charitable organizations like, say, the American Jewish World Service that help people whom we don't know in near or faraway places, but we aren't responsible for them. We hope that they do well. We hope that our contribution is of some use to them, but if not, not. And then we will say that there's nothing more that, that we can do. When we, when we answer yes to the question, am I my brother's keeper, we usually have in mind a parochial notion of the brethren whom we have to keep. In politics, however, the people we have to keep are not only our brethren. Though the reach of the state is not universal, it extends well beyond family and ethnic kin. In late 1947, when the Jews of Palestine were about to enter the political world, David Ben-Gurion spoke to a meeting of Mapai, that's the, the distant ancestor of the Labor Party. He spoke about the responsibilities that would come with statehood, and this is what he said. We must think in terms of a state, in terms of independence, in terms of full responsibility for ourselves and for others. In our state, there will be non-Jews as well, and all of them will be equal citizens, equal in everything without any exception. That is, the state will be their state as well. The attitude of the Jewish state to its Arab citizens will be an important factor, not the only one, but an important factor in building good neighborly relations with the Arab states. The striving for a Jewish-Arab alliance requires us, this is Ben-Gurion in 47, requires us to fulfill several obligations which we are obliged to do in any event. Full and real equality, de jure and de facto, of all the state citizens, gradual realization of the economic, social, gradual equalization of the economic, social, and cultural standard of living of the Arab community with the Jewish community, recognition of the Arabic language as the language of the Arab citizens in the administration, courts of justice, and above all, in schools, municipal autonomy in villages and cities, and so on. <laughs> Van Gurion was certainly too optimistic about the possibility of a Jewish-Arab alliance and more than a little presumptuous in including culture in his talk of equalization. Nor did he and the governments he later led live up to the commitments he described in this speech. Nevertheless, this was the language of a statesman. In the literal sense of that, of that word, a man who understood what it would mean to have a state to be instated in the, in the world. And it was critically important for him to give that speech precisely because the responsibilities of statehood were so new to the people he was addressing. Well, not entirely new. And here perhaps Ben-Gurion's attachment to ancient Jewish history and his intense dislike of the exilic years his desire to negate the exile served him well. I don't think it always did that. He remembered that David's kingdom, as it is described in the Bible, included not only non-Judahite tribes, but also non-Israelite nations. It was pluralist in the old imperial style, even if the imperium was very small. We have no information on how the other nations were treated though some of their members seem to have served in David's army. Remember Uriah the Hittite, who did not fare well, and Etai the Gittite, who did. 
Centuries later, the Hasmoneans extended their rule over foreign nations. We know that one of those nations, the Edomians, the former Edomites, were forcibly converted to Judaism. But other groups apparently were left to their own devices so that there was a substantial non-Jewish population in the land when the Romans conquered it. Exactly what political responsibility meant in those days is unclear, at least to me. But in Tractate of Odazara of the Babylonian Talmud, the rabbis allow the Romans to claim that they have indeed taken responsibility for the well-being of the Jews. Asked by God what they can say for themselves, the Romans reply, master of the universe, we have established numerous forums, built numerous bathhouses, generated an abundance of silver and gold, and all this we did for the sake of Israel so that they could occupy themselves with the Torah. The rabbis dispute this claim, providing an early, critical, anti-imperialist account of Rome's supposed benefits. But even as they deny the Roman claim, they clearly understand what it means to act responsibly, or at least what it means for the Gentiles. They probably don't imagine that Jews can act in that way. They are already stateless, living in exile. Ben-Gurion realized that the Jews, even his Jews, the Zionist vanguard, the leaders of Mapai, had no experience ruling over others, and he also realized that this is something that has to be learned. There's no reason to think that it comes naturally. Domination may or may not come naturally. Responsibility for distant others, people who aren't part of the family, certainly doesn't. It is a political virtue, and we find it best understood, which doesn't mean best enacted, in long-established political elites. The old aristocracy cultivated a sense of service to the lower orders, even when they were actually exploiting the lower orders. They knew what it meant to protect the others, and the claim that they, in fact, provided protection was their legitimizing ideology. Once the modern state was founded, aristocratic families sent many of their children into the higher civil service, and some of those civil servants really did serve the common good and the general welfare. After emancipation, some Jews entered that world of the aristocracy in the civil service, but only in very small numbers and usually at a price. These were assimilated Jews, often converts to Christianity. They imitated their Gentile rulers. They did not produce a specifically Jewish awareness of what I will now call civic responsibility, which is what I think Ben-Gurion meant, or part of what he meant, or what he was trying to get at with the Hebrew word mamlachtiyut. The word is usually translated statism, but I think that civism gives us a better sense of Ben-Gurion's argument. Civism is precisely the acceptance of responsibility for the general welfare. Jean-Jacques Rousseau provides a good account of what that requires when he writes in The Social Contract that citizens, when they are voting, should ask not only what's good for me, what's good for my group, what's good for the middle class, for the steel workers, for old people, for the Jews, but also what's good for the country. They have an interest in the common good, which is also the good of people other than the ones they know. Now consider a true story about Israel today, or just a few years ago, <clears throat> a decade ago. In 1999, I was in Jerusalem on sabbatical. And one day, I read in Haaretz a fascinating story about the minister of labor a Shas minister, that is a, a minister from the religious, from the Sephardic Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox party, a Shas minister in Bibi Netanyahu's first government who had brought suit against a restaurant in a lot for violating the rule against employing Jews on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. The restaurant was fined 200,000 shekels. 
it appealed, and the district court judge, this is what the story was about, reduced the fine to 18 shekels and castigated the minister for what I will call a violation of the norm of mamlak diut. This minister had brought many suits of this kind, the judge said, but not a single suit aimed at enforcing the laws against child labor or the factory safety laws or the laws protecting foreign workers or any other of the laws that one would have thought to be his special responsibility as minister of labor. Ministerial office for him was simply an occasion to advance the projects of his own religious group. He had no sense of being responsible for a state, of being responsible for the well-being of all the citizens of the state and for non-citizens also who lived and worked within the state's boundaries. I'm sure he was a good person and probably a good Jew, but he was a Jew of the exile and of the pre-emancipation exile lost in what must be for him a totally unexpected Jewish state with a substantial non-Jewish population who ever heard of such a thing. So we have to think about that project. I recently came across a text by Isaac Cardozo, the 17th century Portuguese, Spanish, Murano, and later in Italy, defender of Israel, in which Cardozo asks that the Jews be treated in the lands of the exile as resident aliens. And this is what he says. The, Jew, the Gentiles should deal with the Jews as the Jews dealt with the Gentiles, allowing them to live among them so long as they are not idolaters. There were two types of sojourners in Israel, some who were called righteous sojourners. They were those who converted to Judaism, and they were equal to the other Israelites, and others who were called resident sojourners, who desired and were able to live among them, although they did not follow their law. Now, this is an appeal. Cardozo is making an appeal here to the Talmudic rules for the ger toshav, the resident alien, and then to the principle of reciprocity. If we live by these rules, or did, or if we lived by these rules, so should they. Cardozo's argument suggests that taking responsibility for the others doesn't necessarily mean treating them exactly like citizens. Even without reciprocity, the Torah is very clear about this in the book of Exodus, there shall be one law for the citizen and for the stranger who dwells among you. That may be too strong a requirement for resident aliens who are the relevant group of strangers in an immigrant society like the United States. They pay taxes and receive welfare services <clears throat> but are not allowed to vote. By contrast, in a democratic nation state like Israel, members of national minorities are simultaneously strangers and citizens, and then there shall be one law is certainly what both politics and morality require. One law can take different forms. It might mean simple equality, the same rights and the same obligations within a single set of political and social institutions, but it might also mean the same rights and obligations within separate institutions, as in various proposals for Arab-Israeli autonomy. I'm not going to advocate any particular arrangement. The citizens of Israel have to work that out for themselves. But I do want to remember that autonomy was once a Jewish plan to equalize the status of East European Jews. It was a Jewish plan for pluralism in uh, Eastern Europe, defended in detail by um, Shimon Dubnov and by the Bundists. It never had a chance in Europe, and it may not be the right way in Israel. But we need to take it seriously, thinking of our own history as strangers, and we must aim at full equality for Israel's Arabs, if not in this way, then in some other way. That's what Ben-Gurion argued in 1947. It's still an aspiration, 
And there are many Jews in Israel, particularly religious Jews, who don't aspire to it. They think that they are living in a big kahal. And the fact of pluralism, the presence of strangers, is for them an anomaly. But it isn't anomalous at all. It is the normal feature of statehood. Anyone who has a state has to learn to accommodate and protect the different groups within it. From the fact of pluralism, there follows the necessity of recognition. Thank you. <laughs>